Hello, my name is Akim and today I will be talking about foundation of P2P networks. Thank you for joining my talk. I hope this talk will be interesting to you. And today I will be talking about P2P networks and how they work, uh, how they can be used in the real projects and what benefit they bring in our world and the application we build. Okay, let's start with the features of decentralized P2P networks. The first feature is that each member of the network is equal to any other member. What does it mean? For example, in our regular client-server model, where there is a server and there is a client, the server defines rules, its API, permissions, and other stuff, and regulates which client can connect and which cannot connect, and so on. And the client has to abide to those rules, otherwise client cannot connect to the server. And this inequality doesn't apply in P2P networks. Because in P2P networks, each peer is equal and each peer can connect to other without any limitations. The second feature of the P2P networks is that each member communicates to other directly, meaning that, for example, if there is three peers A, B, C, A connected to B and B connected to C, and at some point A wanted to connect to C, it cannot go through B peer. It has to ask B, do you know peer named C? And B says, yes, I know, here's his address. Uh, and then after obtaining an address, the peer A can connect to C peer and communicate to it directly. So they cannot use B as a proxy. Okay, and the application which utilizes those P2P networks, they can like do a lot of useful things. For example, distributing processing power between many peers in the network or distributing storage. And we're not talking about avoiding bans or limitation based on country or other kinds of regulation. So those networks are really wonderful in terms of distribution and like new concepts. So let's talk about <coughs> their components and describe each one separately. So overall, there are four components I decided to underline in this talk. It, it's P2P protocols, it's application level protocols, the first component. And actually, this is a very big component in terms of that P2P protocols unite a lot of internal stuff. We'll talk about it. Okay, and besides P2P protocols, there is a second component, peer discovery. It's about finding um, other peers in the network, also transports and networks. We'll talk about all of this in detail on the next slides. Let's start with P2P protocols. <clears throat> what are those? Those are an application layer protocol which defines base component in uh, P2P networks. Each P2P networks have to implement a couple of, I would say not a couple, a dozen of protocols, a dozen of interface like peer identity, addressing, uh, messaging, connection logic, peer discovery, peer routing, and other stuff, and shakes, uh, transport, and a lot of other things. And all of those, uh, depending on their implementation, build a structure for P2P protocol. And also good to mention, Leap P2P ecosystem, we'll talk about it later which provides basic implementation for most of these interfaces and a lot of modern P2P protocols actually built atop of Leap P2P. Let's carry on. There is next concept of P2P networks is a peer discovery. It's all about finding other peers in the network and connecting with each other, like in the picture demonstrated on this slide. So when the new peer appears in the network, first of all, that peer has to find other peers. Otherwise, it cannot do any useful work for us. Uh, to do that peer would use peer discovery mechanism implemented in one or other way. The very popular peer discovery mechanism is, for example, translates translating a global message through each peer in the network that new peer has appeared and other peers try to contact it and share their information or there are bootstrap peer which uh, has like known 
list of peers in it and the newly created peer can connect to the bootstrap node and ask for the list of uh, closest network participants. And after the peer discovery, uh, there is a very similar challenge is the peer routing is actually when a newly created peer has to find a way to other peers to connect through them, to find a like road and yeah, go through one or other and those and peers to reach their destination. And usually it's implemented by maintaining specific routing table, which is, which has a graph like structure and used for this purpose. Okay. That was the second component. The third component is transport. Transport is data transfer protocols like TCP or UDP. They have alternative, although those two are very popular and used almost everywhere. And good alternative would be quick protocol, <clears throat> which actually an implementation, which is layered atop of UDP protocol and acts like a web socket, a web socket with UDP. And also there are modern protocols like web transport and web RTC, which are efficient ways of communication in browser environment. Very useful there. They use for data transfer, for example, video transfer, and they really efficient in this, in these cases. The fourth mechanism of uh, P2P networks I chose to talk about is a NAT traverse. It's a mechanism that allows communication between public peer and peer and private network, like laptop connected to home Wi-Fi router. For example, if you like have a laptop and you're working on it and you want to interact with outside world with the deployed network on some public machines somewhere in the world, those public servers cannot reach you because your laptop is behind your router. And to overcome this, you would, you can try to configure your Wi-Fi router to allow some, allow accepting external connection to your laptop. But this is difficult for many users. So that's why that traversal mechanism was designed. There are quite a few ways to implement that. And very popular one is just setting up a relay public peer, which are accessible to your private network. And if your laptop wants to interact with the P2P network, your laptop have to connect to that relay peer and keep a long live connection. And while your laptop keeps a connection, <clears throat> other peers can communicate first to relay peer and relay peer just redirect uh, data package uh, to you without uh, interacting them in any way. Yeah, that's how they work. Let's move on. Good examples of P2P networks. First example is the IPFS. Also, there is a BitTorrent. Those two protocols are really uh, popular and they used for file uh, sharing, though they slightly different. Also, there is a Fluence network protocol, uh, which I uh, want to talk today about. And also very popular Ethereum, the centralized blockchain protocol. Mm, I hope uh, almost all of you know about it. Um, hmm. The first, uh, the first protocol I want to talk is IPFS. What is IPFS? IPFS is distributed system for storing and accessing files, website, application, data. I would say almost anything which could be saved in storage <clears throat> and IPFS means interplanetary file system. Okay. Let's, let's look at the IPFS in uh, more details. Yeah, as I mentioned, IPFS is a P2P networks. It's used for storing data and the good use cases is that, for example, you can store your file in a IPFS and that file would be distributed to any other peer of IPFS in the world. And for example, if we choose some popular centralized server like Google or Amazon, and they have some limitation for file sharing in some countries through IPFS, you can <clears throat> avoid those limitations and share your file everywhere where internet is available. And other use case would be much faster 
DOM loading of the file, which is uh, also utilized by BitTorrent protocol, because your f if your file is deployed in many uh, places, like many peers in the network, you can open connections to all those peers and start downloading content for them simultaneously, which greatly speeds up speed of downloading that file. <clears throat> there are also a lot of other features listed in that websites and implementation details, and I really recommend you guys checking this IPFS protocol. It has really cool documentation. But now let's move to the next slide. And the next slide is about Fluence Network Protocol. That protocol is about workload distribution. For example, if you want to build a report or do some computation or heavy calculation, solve complex math, sorry, solve complex math problem, you can use a Fluence Network Protocol, which can distribute your calculations and optimize them. Let's see how it works in detail. There is a documentation of Fluence Network Protocol. There are mm, some features like it fast, secure. Let's see how it works. Actually, Fluence Network is built of peers. Some of these peers are providers which provide, uh, as you can judge by their name, provide computer powers and allow you to utilize that computing power can and clients, client peer, which can also work as a providers, but they also send like a request or express a desire to do some work. For example, in this very small snippet of code, the workload is very simple. Is just a setting status uh, online, just updating the string, but it could be much more complicated. And there is a also specific language of written for interacting with peers in that protocol. It's called Aqua language, and it allows specific execution model and allows one to choose a peer where that code should be executed and that's just a really top of an iceberg of that language. <clears throat> but the main idea of that protocol is that user first write a code and specify execution model. And after doing that, the protocol allows, the protocol executes that code and distribute your workload on many different nodes. Why is this protocol useful? It's because it's decentralized if you distribute your work through Fluence. You do not rely on central provider like Google or Amazon, which can change like requirements or conditions and you have to abide. Otherwise you have to change your architecture to other providers, which could be really time consuming. And also using Fluence protocol is cheaper because there is a free market and each peer can uh, participate in that protocol by proving that it has necessary powers to execute your code and other features. There is also cool documentation here, and there are many example projects in Fluence protocol ecosystem. For example, right now I'm looking at FRPC substrate example. is It's an example of application which connects to decentralized apps and allow distributing their access to the RPC, to the blockchain gates. So we won't uh, talk about it in details right now, but if you are uh, interested, feel free to follow this website, just Google Fluence and see how they work. And now we're getting back to our presentation. The next slide is about additional information. It's actually about LIP2P. Let's look a bit what is LIP2P. Like I mentioned before, lib P2P is a great foundation for building your own decentralized protocol. It has an implementation for many different, many fundamentals, which almost every, every decentralized protocol consists of. For example, it's addressing, peer discovery, peer routing, peer identity, peer info. There's also some transports, 
secure communication, stream multiplexing, and a lot of different stuff, which I mentioned today. Some of this stuff I mentioned, some of them I didn't mention. But yeah, it's really good to go through the documentation. At least there's some uh, introduction passages and just get a basic uh, understanding of what it is and how you can use it. I believe that's all for today's talk. Thanks for listening, guys. See you soon. That's all. Thank you.